Uh, my name is Edward Lynch, I'm a sociologist. Uh, officially, I am the former first vice rector of the European University. Now, I hope to be the future vice rector once I get my working visa. But I'm not speaking here as the vice rector. I'm uh, speaking here as an academic and a sociologist and an uh, intellectual. Uh, I would like to. I could go very easily through all the you know, accomplishments and biographical details uh, in the CVs and various websites about <coughs> Professor Greenfield. Uh, to me, it's more interesting to say uh, uh, something about her as a sociologist. Uh, Professor Greenfield inspired my own work in many ways, and I'm very happy you know, that she's here. Uh, and we meet for the second time, and we barely remember the first time about 20 years ago. My Professor Greenfeld's uh, work on nationalism uh, has been well known, and for a good reason. Uh, it addresses fundamental questions. How nationalism emerged in the world? What were the social conditions and structural reasons for its emergence? How did the ideas of the nation spread from the first societies in which it appeared, notably England, to France, to Germany, to Russia, uh, how these ideas were transformed uh, in the process of dissemination. How different types of nationalism, we'll hear about that today, were uh, <coughs> uh, emerged in, in, in the process of this diffusion. How did we go from the civic individualist nationalism of England to the civic collectivist nationalism of France to the ethnic nationalist of ethnic nationalism of Germany and Eastern Europe and a somewhat more complex ethnic nationalism of Russia. Um, so, uh, so that's one uh, that the work uh, nationalism five roads to modernity the you know first big book although there were and there was a book before that. Uh, how it, it really uh, emerged and, 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 and how, how, did, um, <coughs> how did the idea of the nation spread. Uh, in the process of, of that work, uh, Professor Winter was inspired by classical sociology, which I also like. Uh, I think her foundational thinkers are Max Weber and Ingram Turkheim, and not Karl Marx, I would say. Uh, and definitely she's under the influence also of Mark Bloch, as she says in one of her, in one of her books. Uh, to me, the idea proved very attractive because, you know, in standard functionalist explanations of nationalism, nationalism is a byproduct of the modernization process. In the work of Karl Deutsch, in the work of Ernest Gellner, who is more famous than Deutsch, nationalism is a byproduct of industrialization, urbanization, the increase in cultural communication, and the spread of vernacular languages. Uh, and it fulfills the function of enabling a modern industrial society uh, to, to uh, develop. Uh, and although he's not a functionalist, Benedict Anderson also uh, somewhat adopts this idea through his work on print nationalism and the spread of nationalism uh, uh, the imagined community of the nation. Professor Greenfield, you know, reverts or rather uh, turns it up on its head. Nationalism is the cause and modernity is the consequence. <coughs> so in her explanatory framework, and she'll explain that, that much better than me, nationalism is really uh, uh, at the core of the emergence of the modern world and modernity as we know it, and it predates industrialization and modernization. And the idea uh, becomes a material force, the quote Karl Marx, but at a later date. Uh, the idea comes first. And why and how it comes about uh, is something that she addressed in, in, her, in her work. The second big book on nationalism, Nationalism and the Spirit of Capitalism, tried to apply this framework to economic history and challenged the conventional Weber thesis about the Protestant ethic. At the root of national, at the root of the capitalist development, rather at the root of the spirit of capitalism, the culture that was supportive of capitalist development, um, and successfully so, uh, I think. Uh, of course, uh, and then there is a, a, a third book, uh, which I confess I haven't read because I don't have time, but I'd love to read it: *Mind Modernity and Madness: The Impact of Culture and Human Experience*. Where uh, she tries to show how the emergence of a modern mobile society, partially 
almost in effect by nationalism, uh, shaped uh, uh, our ideas and, and not only our ideas, shaped the emergence of, of mental illness, which is a, a quite radical thesis. Now, why do I like Professor Greenfield's work? I like it because it's challenging, it's interesting, it's paradoxical, and it's bold. And I always tell to my students, you know, we can produce professionals and specialists, and you can do a lot of routine science, and that is very respectable uh, and absolutely fine. Uh, but the people who really move us in a new direction, you know, advance rather radical views sometimes, and I think Professor Greenfield would agree that your views on this question intellectually are challenging, radical, innovative, and bold. Uh, and it's much better, in the big scheme of things, to be potentially wrong in an interesting way than to be right in a boring way. Uh, because that's what advances human knowledge, and that's what makes us think differently. Now, just a little comment on biography. And, you know, I share, in part, this kind of biography. Uh, Professor Greenfield was, was born in Russia and lived in Russia for the first 17 years of her life. So you can, and Morsh was a very nice Pavlovsky. And I'm still quite young. He doesn't look too young. So that's one. Uh, and then she moved on to Israel and then the United States. And, you know, sociology is a travel intellectually from one, from one place to the other, actually. Sociological consciousness emerges uh, through the experience in part of cultural diversity, as we like to say, but really the exposure to different cultural frameworks and worldviews. And, you know, I had something of a similar experience moving from Yugoslavia to the United States, and now to Russia, and so on. Uh, and I think that I can't claim that I'm much smarter for it. I don't think that follows automatically. But uh, what I can say is that you know there's a certain richness that is added by this by this experience, uh, and I think Professor Greenfield exhibits that richness in her work, uh, that richness of experience and that Bechstein, you know, internal understanding of different social and cultural contexts, and, and of course in her case also different epochs of human history, which takes a lot of imagination and empathy and ability to understand. So that's the, that's the second thing I wanted to say, uh, and I'll, I'll finish my, my uh, long, long introduction uh, by also saying that her books are written beautifully. And beauty in writing you know, is very difficult in social science because most of us are taught to produce articles in a somewhat mechanical way, right? I mean, state your thesis, where's your research question, you know, do this first, do this next, do this third. And that's all wonderful, but sometimes you fall asleep on page three. Uh, and I can guarantee you that, you know, in the case of Professor Greenfield's book, your books and, and essays, you'll never fall asleep. Uh, uh, you'll never fall asleep. Her, her writing is extremely graceful and interesting and captivating. So, I'm sure he won't be disappointed, and I'm giving the floor to your professor. Let's well, read. after such a wonderful introduction, <laughs> it would be difficult for you not to be disappointed. So, <laughs> um, and I might fall asleep while you won't, because I have jet lag. So I'm not entirely sure that. Um, that I'm not sleep, speaking in my sleep. So let me start by, uh, uh, by um, formulating a thesis of one of the theses of this particular lecture, which is the beginning of a series of two, so that my next lecture would follow from that. Usually, uh, we think that globalization and nationalism are two opposing trends. But I uh, entitled this lecture Globalization of Nationalism. And this is because the only globalization that is happening is 
the globalization of national consciousness. National consciousness was born in the 16th century in England. And since then, it has been spreading. Only very recently, it became a global phenomenon. It became a global phenomenon with its final penetration in the last two decades into China. For this reason, I perhaps would spend more time on China than I would on France, Russia, and Germany. Though we will all understand that before it reached China, it spread from England into other European countries. What is nationalism? To understand it, it is uh, important to compare it, compare it and the world which it created to the world which it replaced. We think today that a civilized or advanced or developed society presupposes the realization of the values of freedom, equality, and popular sovereignty. In fact, we call this democracy. And we think that there can be no developed and civilized society without democracy. Civilization, the process of civilization in our minds is the process of progressive realization of these values in society. But this is not so at all. These became our values only with the birth of nationalism. Equality and freedom and popular sovereignty and democracy are not the goal or the talus of civilization. Nationalism was born in the 16th century in England. At that time, all European societies embedded in Western Christianity were based on the principle of fundamental inequality of people. This was the society of orders willed so by God, and it consisted fundamentally of three orders, the nobility, obelatores, the priesthood, oratores, and the people, or laboratories. The two upper and lower strata were as different as we today presume species of life are different. There was absolutely no possibility to be born a member of the people and become a nobleman. No conceivable possibility. Sometimes it happened, but this was inconceivable. One could not understand it. This would be similar to being born a chicken and growing up to be a person, a human being. Even their blood was different. And there was a real belief that their blood was completely different. It couldn't mix. The, the blood of the people was red, the blood of the nobility was blue. The blood, for example, of French kings who constituted an order in their own right was translucent. 
It was completely chemically different. Nobody would use the word chemically, but it was completely different from the blood of anyone else. So it couldn't mix. At the middle order, the order of the priesthood, basically recruited the lower clergy from the people and the upper clergy from the nobility. And since this order did not procreate, they couldn't marry, so they couldn't have children, basically this was simply, it wasn't a middle order, it was simply mimicking the structure of society in itself. It didn't at all contribute to the nature of the society of orders. Now this society constituted by beings of completely different nature was so willed by God. As such, it was absolutely just. This inequality was just to imagine something where there would be equality between those orders would be completely unjust. <coughs> it would be the, the very uh, idea of injustice. Now, something happened in England in the 16th century, or rather in the 15th century. In the 15th century, the royal family of Plantagenets uh, couldn't decide which branch of this family would have to become would uh, have to become the king, and so the two branches, the Lancasters and the Yorks, represented by the white and the red rose, they engaged in a war that lasted uh, for many many years. Of course, they were supported by various uh, feudal aristocrats who were uh, connected to them and moved between those <coughs> two branches of the family. And as a result of this War of the Roses, the feudal aristocracy of England was completely physically destroyed. That is, no nobleman remained alive. Three <coughs> actually did, but three wasn't enough to constitute an order. A new king came to power, the first Tudor king, Henry VII, and he needed, of course, an aristocracy to rule. So people from the people started rising up, and there resulted a period of about 100 years, a whole century, of more or less upward mobility. Now, such mobility was inconceivable. It could not be imagined within the society of orders. But now, all the aristocrats in England in the beginning of the 16th century came from the people. They needed to explain to themselves, or as Freud would say, to rationalize, that is, to justify their own experience. And because this experience was a good experience, they didn't want to explain it away. They actually wanted to legitimate it. And how did they legitimate it? They said, oh, the English people is a nation. The word nation at that time, as used in the church councils in Western Christianity, meant an elite of representatives of the secular and religious princes. So those were tiny groups of very powerful individuals. And those very powerful, very, uh, very influential individuals decided the, decided the fate of Europe, which for them, of course, was the world. This is what the word nation meant at that time. The word people, as I already intimated, 
at that time meant plebs, only the lower strata. Nobody would ever want to identify with the plebs, right? It would be, I mean, identifying with the scum of the earth. Oh, I belong to that very despicable strata. What happened, because of the experience of the new and rich and aristocracy, was that they made the people, they redefined the people as the nation. And the people became the object of loyalty and identification. You must understand that before that, in any society, let's say we're speaking about England or France, any society, but there was no inclusive identity. The nobility could not identify with the people. The people could not identify with the nobility. Those were exclusive identities within the same society. Now, this new redefinition actually created an inclusive identity. So a completely new consciousness appeared, a new view of reality. And this consciousness was national consciousness, simply because of the word nation that was used. <coughs> This was a new view of reality. Now reality was imagined, instead of being imagined, as um, three different orders. Now it was imagined as consisting, the world, as consisting of sovereign communities of fundamentally equal members because the entire people <clears throat> was now an elite. The elite represented the authority in uh, their society so that the entire people was where the authority happened, where what was the locus of authority. Such communities of fundamentally equal members were called in English that was emerging at that time because English of the 15th century was a very different English. Modern English was only emerging with this new consciousness. And so such societies that is a fundamentally equal sovereign community was called in English nation. That's why we're talking about nationalism. This is what nationalism is. Nationalism is the framework of modernity. It is the cultural framework of modernity, the consciousness on which anything that is modern rests. So we are all nationalists because we all have national consciousness. We think we see the universe through this lens. And our existential experience as a result is determined by nationalism. It would take too long to talk about all the implications of nationalism. They're colossal, as I already said. I mean, our entire existence is the product of this consciousness. But let's just talk about the most important ones of them. The definition of the people as an elite, that is the definition of the people and the nation, the equation of those two terms, makes people an object of loyalty. 
it creates a dignified, inclusive identity. Obviously, this identity is now dignified. Everyone is a member of an elite, of an elite and a sovereign community. Necessarily implies egalitarianism, popular sovereignty, that is fundamental equality between all the members of the nation and the community as sovereign. And most importantly, it endows the personal identity of every member of a nation with dignity. This is really a colossal change in the existential experience of humanity. Before nationalism, dignity was the property, the experience of very narrow upper strata. Only the nobility basically had dignity. The lot of the people, of the regular people, was humility and abnegation. They were not respected. They did not respect themselves. This simply was not a part of the experience. But now dignity becomes the experience of every member of the nation. Now, dignity is a very pleasant experience. I can even make an experience experiment right now and ask you, all of you, to imagine a moment when you felt dignified. For example, you got uh, a prize, you know, uh, for something, or you published an article or a book, or you got accepted into a nice university, right? Now just imagine that. What you are feeling, I know that I made this experiment many times, you're all feeling the same physical sensation. Your chest expands. You become taller. You feel there is more air in your lungs. It is a rem and then imagine, you can also imagine, the experience of humiliation. Also can remember something. An experience humiliation is an extremely physically unpleasant sensation. So the moment people acquire the possibility of this experience of <clears throat> dignity, this experience became addictive like a drug. And so after that, nobody would give it up. This is the reason for the extraordinary appeal of nationalism. This is the reason why, beginning in a small island at a certain time by accident, when it became available, it spread all around the world. In addition, what are the implications of uh, nationalism? Freedom of choice, the emergence of the very idea of individual as an autonomous agent. You mentioned Durkheim. Durkheim says in the um, in the division of labor in society that it is modern society that invents the individual. And he has his explanation, which is not very convincing. But indeed, the individual is invented by society. Modern society is the society created by nationalism. And this is why modern society creates the individual. Before that, this sort of idea did not exist, and therefore such individuals did not exist. And then, 
nationalism replaces God by man as the maker of man. Because freedom of choice implies that everyone now can make oneself. You decide what you want to be in life. You are not there where you are being put by your birth. No. You are in control of your fate, of your destiny. At the same time, God is replaced by the people as the bearer of sovereignty. So even though this doesn't have to be explicit. Nobody has to formulate that. Nationalism is a fundamentally secular form of consciousness. It is completely focused on this world. And now people, remarkably, they who would die for God, this happened throughout history, certainly throughout Christian history. Now suddenly they would die and they would kill for the nation. So basically the nation replaces God. This means, among other things, this is also an obvious implication of nationalism, that nationalism means democracy. If you subscribe to <coughs> democracy, you are a nationalist. It, it just cannot be otherwise. Every nation is a democracy by definition. However, there are different types of nationalism. Nationalism is not an homogeneous phenomenon. And as a result, there are different types of democracy. Nationalism emerges <coughs> in England as an individualistic consciousness. Why? Because the very experience that it was called on to explain was the experience of individuals. It was those individuals who were upwardly mobile. Now, when the nation itself is imagined as a composite entity, as an association of individuals, nationalism would be individualistic. But the membership of the nation in an individualistic nation would necessarily be voluntary. The individual who doesn't want to belong to the nation would not belong to the nation. So, actually, nationality, the membership in the nation, would be the same as citizenship, as accepting certain duties within a community, and with those duties also accepting various rights. This was English nationalism. But when the nation is imagined as a collective individual, the interesting thing is that in the English of uh, that early period, I mean the language of that early period, and this was so through the entire 18th century uh, American English, the nation is a plural noun. So the pronouns that correspond to the nation and to the people are the pronouns we and they. Some of you may uh, know how the uh, Constitution of the United States begins, we the people. But already in France, the nation acquires its own individuality. That is, it becomes a collective individual. And we no longer refer to those nations the same, of course, is true about Russia. We no longer refer 
to uh, these nations in the plural. We refer to them in the singular, and very often in personal singular as she or he, mostly she. But the people would be he, you know. Uh, so, when you imagine the nation as uh, a collective individual, that would be a collectivistic nationalism. Why? Because as a collective individual, it would have its own will and its own interests. And those will and interests would no longer depend on the wills and interests of the majority of the individuals. That's why you would have this different from majoritarian democracy. Majoritarian democracy is necessarily an individualistic nationalism. But then you, when you have a collectivistic nationalism, there must be somebody. It doesn't matter what the majority of individuals think. Those majority of individuals, they're like cells in an organism. We pitilessly cut our own nails because we don't care how those nails feel when we, when we cut them, right? Those are just cells that are not very useful for our organism that, uh, when they grow too long. And so individual rights are not that very important. Individual lives are not that very important. Individual, individuals can be sacrificed at any moment when it serves the good and the will and the interests of the nation. And then you have to have necessarily an elite that would um, decipher, divine the will and the interests of the nation. And as a result, you have a natural aristocracy that emerges in collectivistic nationalisms. And this is so whether the membership of the nation is still voluntary as was the situation in France, as is the situation in France even now, or when it is defined as a biological necessity, which is the situation in ethnic nations, such, for example, as <coughs> Germany or as Russia. In any case, individualistic nationalisms produce liberal democracy. They produce institutions that safeguard the rights of individuals. Collectivistic nationalisms, whether they are civic or ethnic, tend to produce authoritarian democracies. But they're nevertheless democracies. So uh, this is very important to understand. Authoritarian democracies are no less <coughs> democracies than, uh, than individualistic democracies because everything is done in them <coughs> for the people, by the people, because the uh, authority of the people is always recognized and uh, um, because the people are considered fundamentally equal. What is important is that despite, um, despite these types and differences, the existential experience in nations and in democracies, therefore in democracies, is very similar no matter what type they are. So dignity is the core of moral of, of modern experience. It is the source of the appeal of nationalism, and it is the source of all political conflicts between and within nations. So whenever there are conflicts in the modern world, it all will be about dignity and not anything else. So for example, not economics. 
economics would not provoke conflicts, great conflicts. But here we have, <clears throat> we arrive at a moment when in fact we need another very important concept. And um, this is this is where um, I begin a new project, and I want to share it with you. We must introduce here the concept of civilization. Its importance, the importance of the concept of civilization, is only now, that is, in the last two decades, is becoming clear. People were bandying the word around, of course, but it didn't mean anything much, and uh, it didn't contribute anything to our understanding of reality. Now it is becoming clear that it is a very important concept, and that it actually does contribute something very important to our understanding of reality. <clears throat> it is becoming clear because of the surprising and sudden rise of China. We are only now discovering China and we are discovering it at once and yet it always existed. Of course, it existed on the borders of Russia for, you know, for as long as basically Russia as we know it exists. And yet we never noticed it. Um, we never noticed it in the same way as, uh, as we never, we do not notice the moon. You know, it also exists constantly. And so it is observed, but not seen. It is like there, but it doesn't matter. And suddenly, it emerged China, not the moon, but China, as some sort of volcanic explosion. And it changed our world. We already know that it has changed our world. It just happened within our living memory. I would say that <clears throat> we didn't notice it certainly before the Beijing Olympics of 2008. We're talking about a decade. And now already, when I arrived in Pulkova, everything is in Chinese. It's, it's quite amazing. I don't know how much time I have, but uh, I remember um, Chadaev, who wanted Russia to convert to, to Catholicism because he wanted so much Russia to be a Western, a European state. And he said, well, of course, I, I'm just quoting from memory in one of his letters of the one for which he was declared a madman. But this passage, nobody noticed. He said, well, of course it is Europe from which we have to, uh, which we have to imitate and from which we can derive all the important examples for us. Would anyone think that such examples could come from the East, from Japan or China? This would be an absolute abomination. The, the, there was such contempt for the East among Russian intelligentsia. But of course, not only from uh, Russian intelligentsia. I mean, we, we know this, I mean, this is how it was. Another example would be Kimpling, right? So uh, the, this was the attitude as if the sun was rising 
actually in the West and not the other uh, way around. And now we suddenly discovered it. And discovering China, we realized that there is another major level, at least I realized, that there is another major level of difference behind the level of specific nations. Of course, France and England are different. But they look completely like twins when you compare them. <clears throat> to that other place, that other thing, that other world. So behind the level of specific nations, behind even types of nationalism, and even behind the difference between pre-national and national consciousness. This is the highest level of difference, the highest level where humanity forks, branches out into separate cultural traditions. And those separate cultural traditions create different psychological dynamics. And those different psychological dynamics, basically they create different minds. Our brains are the same but the minds can be truly different, which means the way of thinking and the way of feeling. So, the remarkable thing is that in our civilization, which I call, I mean, from the point of view of China, it is called the West. Uh, when we use the word, the, the phrase Western civilization, we usually exclude from it um, Islam, and very often we exclude from it Eastern Christianity too, so Russia is not included. Well, uh, what is the West for China? I would say, and that's why I prefer to use this phrase, it is monotheistic civilization. It is civilization embedded in the three monotheistic uh, religions. So nationalism, when it emerged for a very long time, uh, and certainly <coughs> until the end of the 19th century, it spread only within the monotheistic civilization. And within, the only exception was Japan, and I will speak about that. And within its original civilization, the experience of dignity has been tightly connected to the experience of equality, so that Whenever we feel ourselves treated unequally with somebody else, it is our dignity that suffers. Which is, presupp which is based on the presupposition of fundamental equality between all those nations and all those individuals within those nations. A presupposition to which comparability and actual comparison is essential. In Russia, in particular, this is very, very constantly clear that Russia feels, Russian nationalists, Russians feel humiliated if they are not treated as equals to the Western nations. They feel that their dignity suffers from that. The experience of inequality, therefore a threat to one's dignity, gives rise to existential envy, 
which may lead to what Nietzsche called ressentiment, that is very deep resentment that is constantly re-experienced, that foments constantly, and as a result produces very hateful ideologies and aggression. <coughs> and this can happen on the collective and on individual levels. This means that envy is a central psychological factor in our civilization. A central psychological factor that accompanies nationalism in our civilization. The very corollary of the preoccupation with dignity. When you have this preoccupation with dignity, there is envy somewhere very close. So let me perhaps, um, before we move further, introduce to you the concept of civilization. So civilization is a, is a, is a meaningful concept that can help us to explain something is a distinct, self-enclosed, self-sufficient, and self-generating variant of cultural reality that, for all intents and purposes, independently of other such variants with which it may coexist, has developed over multiple generations, multiplying in the process its interlacing traditions. It is an enduring, self-sufficient culture with codified first principles, resistant to outside influences. Mega or meta culture, allowing for the existence of numerous specific cultures and traditions within the same set of first principles. Now, when I am saying enduring in this context, I mean spanning many generations, at least five centuries. When I'm talking about first principles, I mean binding unquestioned values and ideas that determine existential experience. And when I say codified, I mean embodied in the written language and transmitted through language itself. Now, <clears throat> one can only define a the first principles of civilization in comparison with other civilizations. So, without China, we cannot understand ourselves to the end. It is thanks to ob the observation of the other that we can learn to understand ourselves. And what does China teach us, among other things? It can teach us, for example, the colossal importance of monotheism in our thinking. Now, I already told you uh, something about you, and you may think, what does she know about me and us? They told you that you're all nationalists. I mean, what, uh, whether you know that, uh, it's like speaking prose, you know? This is something one learns about oneself. Whether you know that or not, you are all nationalists. We simply do not think in other way. And in the same, in the same way, I can tell you that you are all monotheists. We are all monotheists, whether or not we believe in God. 
Even the atheists among us remain monotheists. And we cannot, we simply cannot exit this framework. We would become mad if we exit this framework. Everything will end. Because monotheism creates logic. Logic did not exist. Logic as we understand it. Logic of no contradiction. Logic based on the principle of no contradiction. The one that Aristotle was the first to formulate was not possible. It was simply inconceivable in Greece before the uh, 6th century BC, in Greece of the myth. And that's why classicists call this moment of replacing myth with logic. They call it the Greek miracle. Miracle is something that one cannot explain, right? And they even use, because it is so inconceivable, they even use the Greek words for that. They don't translate it into the languages in, in which they actually write it. English, German, whatever. They call it the transition from mythos to logos because it is inconceivable for us Western people that there can be a time without logic. But there was such a time. Polytheistic society cannot create logic. Why? Logic of no contradiction. Because it is not a universe. It is a collection of many worlds, each ruled by its own God, who have all those gods, they have their own whims, you know, which means, and those worlds coexist, which means there are no contradictions in this world. You can have coexistence of anything, and there is no contradiction. Only in a universe, one world, under one law, created by one God, and therefore consistent, perfectly consistent, there can be contradictions. I mean, you find contradictions, but there should be no contradictions. Because this negates the very idea. So this is how logic emerges. It emerges with the first reduction of the Bible in the 6th century of the Hebrew Bible. In the 6th century BC in Babylon. And it is from there that Thales imports it to Greece. Thales, who we call the father of science, etc., etc. Now, what happens? For a while, this is of no great importance because a very small group of people reads the Hebrew Bible, and a much, much smaller uh, number of people reads Aristotle. Right? But then Hebrew Bible gives rise to Christianity. And the text is translated into Greek and later into Latin. And then it is the translation of the Bible that creates 
the modern vernaculars and the very principles of logic that are built into the text create our modern languages and therefore transmitted through those modern languages. And this primacy of logic for us that causes us to believe that logic is universal human endowment, that it is built into our brains. Because we feel logically, not only do we act on the basis of logic, we feel on the basis of logic. Think about our love relations. You know, there can be either one, you love me or you don't love me. I mean, this is how it is, right? Now, the remarkable thing, is, and politics, think that politics is completely guided by logic. And in China, it is not. And this is, this is absolutely shocking. When I first told my <laughs> Eastern friends about this, well, I actually called a Japanese friend and I said, listen, I just discovered that logic is ours. It is not yours. Uh, I was afraid to say that uh, in America at first, I wanted first to share it with the people in the East because in America this would be considered an absolute racism. And there was, when I, when I called her in Japan, there was a minute of silence between, uh, and then she said, yes, we have always known that, but we didn't want to tell you. And she gave me, now you understand when, oh well, you will understand it. Um, she gave me a Buddhist principle, formulation of a Buddhist principle that in English would um, be translated as thing, comma, thing, no boundaries, which means that everything can be transformed into anything. There are no categories. There are no borders between phenomena. So life is a part of death, and death is a part of life. Animal, there are no borders between animal and human being. And there are no borders between human being and an angel. I mean, it's all the same. There is no truth that is opposed to falsehood because truth transforms into falsehood and bad. You see, it's a completely different way of experiencing life. So, this is the reasons, logic is the reason for the psychological dynamics created by nationalism in our civilization. Because our identities, right, there are two reasons. Our identities are culturally, uh, our cultural identities are interdependent. They're not self-sufficient. They're all the time vis-a-vis -vis somebody else and because logic necessarily leads to sensitivity to contradictions and to the existence of the very category of the individual. In the East there is no such category. 
the individual is part of something. But there is actually no individual. So, Monteism leads to logic, leads to sensitivity, to contradictions. To the necessary comparison of comparables. <coughs> Equality means likeness, right? Like, Russia is equal to France, has to be treated the same way as France, because it is like France. And yet, there is the experience that it is very unlike France, that it is unequal and not treated as equal, right? And you can have this on the level of the individuals, too. And so a contradiction is created. And it is experienced as anomie, as Durkheim's anomie. which is an extremely unpleasant psychological experience. And this leads to envy and ressentiment. But when you don't have that, this kind of logical thinking, you would not have this, those dynamics. So, in, uh, uh, in 1853, some black ships, they were called American black ships, barged into uh, the closed Uraga Harbor in Japan. And at the point of a gun, forced Japan to open up. Nationalism, everywhere where it spread within our civilization, spread by imitation. It was imported from within. France imported it from England. England couldn't, England of course considered France a nation in any case, but it didn't care whether they realized that or not. France imported it from England. Russia imported it from uh, the West, etc., etc., etc. In Japan, it was exported. They brought it to Japan. And when the Japanese realized what it is, they very quickly learned. But they didn't convert to it. Everywhere within our civilization, there was a conversion, similar to religious conversion. That is, you had one view of reality, one existential experience. Then you imported nationalism. And because it gave you dignity, suddenly the entire picture of the world changed. In Japan, it was not like that. In Japan, there are no contradictions. So they added nationalism to this series of other things that they practice. Because they understood that one cannot really deal with those people in the West unless you practice some of those practices. But of course, I, I remember that when I studied Japan, I was very, very, I couldn't understand what was happening. Because their very psychology was so different, but I couldn't understand why there was no envy and no ressentiment in Japan. It was badly, horribly mistreated by the Western powers. But there was no envy, no ressentiment. There was this feeling of a very good student who received deserved criticism. And, ah, OK, so uh, 
I really didn't do my homework well. Now I'm going to work hard and I will do my homework very well. And they did. This was remarkable. But when it, this happened to China, when China finally developed nationalism, this is becoming clear. They cannot develop the same psychological dynamics because there are no preconditions for those dynamics. Logic of no contradiction is not privileged. There is no sensitivity to contradictions, therefore there are no contradictions. There is also no presumption of kinship with the world to the West and no desire to be like it. The concept is Western learning, Western knowledge, Eastern ethics. They combine them. And so there is, th those are the lozenges of the, the um, mottos of the nationalists. So, So what we have here, we have the sense of absolute self-sufficiency of cultural identity. They don't need to compare themselves to anyone else. They know they're the middle kingdom. They know they are the center of the universe, of their universe. They're very pragmatic. They would do whatever they need to do. And when they don't need it, they would change. I mean, th there is no need to be consistent. Their thinking is always relational. It's not categorical. Which allows for extraordinary flexibility in everything. And so, they are attracted to dignity just as anyone else, because this is a physically wonderful thing. But they separate dignity from equality on the individual level, which means that there is no conflict within. They can be unified in their competition. Their competition is not for comparison. It is just for dignity. Which means that when China is rising because of nationalism. It is rising because it decided to enter into the competition with the world and to claim its dignity. But this penetration of nationalism into China, this globalization of nationalism, creates a dramatic change in the nature of nationalism itself. And because China is going to rule, I mean, the next week already or something like that. It's very, very imminent. This is a complete change in the world order. Well, <clears throat> here I will stop. Thank you very much. In my introduction, I think I promised paradox and provocation, and I think it happened. And certainly in that sense, you succeeded uh, in meeting our expectations. I have quite a few questions, but I'd like to give the floor to others. Yeah. It would be much. nice if you introduce yourself, because uh, that, that always. Uh, I am Edward Panarin. I used to work at this university, and now I'm at the Paris School of Economics. 
Like Vilko, I read the two books, but not the third, and it inspired my thinking, and so I'm a fan and an admirer. But um, I have two questions. Uh, number one is, what do you make of Kuomintang, uh, the Nationalist Party of China, that have emerged not in the last two decades, but way before, and I argue, argue in Taiwan, they, they were actually successful into making uh, their society affluent and modern way before the mainland China. And the second, uh, maybe a bit <clears throat> unexpected, a question about the United States and its rising inequality uh, and the so-called deplorables. And I remember very well the chapter on the United States in, in, in your book, but that was way before the, the recent developments. And it certainly must relate somehow to the dignity and all those issues that you discussed in your work. And uh, I also wonder what you make of this. And uh, if I know that social scientists uh, are not very good at forecasting things, but at least what you think. Thank you. Let's do one by one. I think it's going to be uh, easier. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, those are fantastic questions. Very, very good, both of them. When I'm talking about uh, globalization of nationalism into China, I actually mean the penetration of uh, China, of those hundreds of millions of people. Uh, nationalism arrived in China uh, in, um, to give you a precise date, in 1898. This is when the, the first nationalist intellectual wrote a nationalist text. This was Yang Fu. The uh, stim stimulus of the emergence of nationalism in China was the defeat by Japan in the uh, war of 1994-95. Uh, um, the interesting thing is that various Western powers uh, including Russia, constantly were nibbling at the borders there, and the Chinese couldn't care less. They were, they were not sufficiently human for them. You see, this was a great civilization, 5,000 years old, very rich, certainly culturally very rich. But when Japan, an erstwhile vassal, because it was a vassal, uh, a country whom the Chinese called Wa, that is the dwarf, right, affected such a defeat there. This really shocked them. <coughs> the remarkable thing was that, again, it didn't create any feeling of, of envy or ressentiment against Japan. It just created an astonishing surprise and the feeling, well, what did we do wrong? You know, they didn't say, oh gosh, I mean, Japan humiliated us. Uh, it humiliated them because it showed to them that, uh, look, you could be so easily beaten, you know. So many of uh, the Japanese uh, the Chinese intellectuals went to Japan to study. They went to Japan in particular. They also later, influenced by Japan, they went to the West. But first they went to Japan. And it is, they derived this feeling and this, this uh, all the ideas of uh, nationalism from Japan. They learned. In fact, you mentioned Kuomintang, which means uh, the uh, movement of a nation, the very, the very word for the nation, which was a new word created in Japan in the 1860s, Kukomin, became the Kuomin of, of the Chinese. So, yeah, the, right. So uh, uh, the people of the country, not, not even the state, because the state 
was already an implication of that. So the, exactly the unified identity, the inclusive identity. And uh, not only that, but many, many, many um, uh, other, uh, the, the whole vocabulary of nationalism. And with it, all the ideas were taken from Japan. And <coughs> Kuomintang was only one uh, nationalist movement. The other nationalist movement, which uh, emerged more or less at the same time, uh, Kuomintang basically in uh, 1919, and uh, the communist movement in, uh, uh, in uh, 1921. And just like uh, everywhere else, communism was, of course, just another name for nationalism. This is how it emerged in, in Marx, you know, for Karl Marx. This is how it emerged in Russia. I mean, it's not, uh, after all, uh, the very predecessor of the communist party here were the, the populists, which is uh, the, uh, the exact translation of nationalists in Russia, right? Narodnichistra is nothing but nationalism. So the same thing happened there. So those different nationalist parties, why the communists adopted communism and not, uh, because Kuomintang was already taken, right? So. And then they fought each other, unless they fought together, the Japanese, right? And the communists uh, won. The communists won. Mao was a nationalist, certainly. This is so very clear, I mean, in everything. Um, and, um, but he wasn't a successful nationalist, in the sense that he didn't manage to to uh, inspire the people. Why? He didn't manage to inspire the people because the Chinese traditional structure was the structure in which bureaucrats, intellectuals, were the only ones who had dignity. And they despised the people. And in China, it meant that they despised hundreds of millions of people, right? And then Ding Xiaoping, you know, came and said, enrich yourself because the glory of China depends on your being economically successful. The great majority of people are engaged in economic activity. When you tell the people that the glory of China depends on what you do for living in any case, this invited all those masses into this enchanted circle of dignity. And immediately, you saw the explosion of nationalism in China, which indeed took very, econ very economic form, because it was the economically engaged people who became nationalists. But at the same time, it immediately also took all the other forms. So that is the thing. The important thing is that, not that it didn't exist, that the ideas did not exist, but that finally it took root. Now about uh, the uh, USA. Uh, I agree that social scientists should not ever make predictions. But one can speculate about foreseeable future. Because it is foreseeable precisely because it is already happening in the present, right? And I would say that it's not only that China is rising that puts us in different positions. But the West, including Russia and the countries of Islam, the West is rapidly sinking. Europe, of course, it is rapidly sinking 
because it lost confidence in itself. And in the United States, the leader of the free world, so to speak, it is expressed in a very uh, acute fashion. Half of the country completely lost confidence in the necessity of the United States and in the goodness of the United States and in the contribution of the United States uh, to the world and in the value of the American leadership. They lost confidence. And the deplorables who you mentioned, they did not. This is the other half. And they're very upset. They're upset because they're constantly denied dignity by the elites on the coast who constantly tell them, you are no good white man. So this is what is happening. And of course it is terrible because the split is basically between the two halves of the nation. So that is a sad situation. Yes. Thank you for your uh, amazing talk. Uh, my name is Marina. I used to be a PhD student here, and uh, now I work as a researcher in political theory. Uh, my question is um, about, uh, I would say, ideological underpinnings of nationalism. Uh, you know, in critical theory, there's always a tendency to distinguish the good nationalism from the bad nationalism, the reactionary from the progressive. And of course, especially in the context of your analysis, we know that political ideologies is nothing but the modern invention. Uh, so I would just uh, really love you to uh, comment on that and how this uh, attempt to distinguish different uh, types of nationalism, emancipatory, uh, reactionary, etc. Uh, fit with your uh, explanatory framework and with the history of nationalism uh, as you uh, showed it. This is, this is also a very, very good question. Uh, I would translate this question uh, into the um, uh, into the terms of uh, the modern political spectrum, left and right. Uh, left and right, as you know, and, uh, left is progressive, and right is conservative uh, and reactionary. Uh, left is uh, um, moving in the direction of history, and uh, the right is trying to stop it. Uh, uh, well, and uh, critical theory is very much based on those presuppositions. Uh, left and right, as I'm sure you all know, emerged as uh, the actual geographical positions of uh, nationalists in the National Assembly. Uh, basically, the um, the uh, Montagne La Vallée, right of the. Uh, representatives of uh, uh, more radical faction or the left and more moderate. Not that they were uh, not nationalists and didn't want equality and all that. They all wanted that, but they thought that perhaps you shouldn't chop the head of the king and you know uh, you could do it in some other fashion. Um, so uh, the difference between them wasn't that uh, great. Uh, the left won. And since then, the left and the right became cultural tropes, which means that they lost all their meaning oh, uh, in the sense that 
there was no argument behind them, behind those terms, but just a, uh, a certain absolute truth, right? A, a very familiar scenario, for example, uh, that progress is left and conservatism is right, uh, or that left is good and right is not good. So basically, the evaluative, uh, evaluative attitude. Uh, now, we all imbibed that. We we all use those terms and very rarely stop to analyze what actually is happening. But when you do stop to analyze, there is no such thing as progress. Right. So what is progressive? Any change is progressive. Any change would lead to something better than what existed before? Not necessarily. In fact, very often it's the opposite, right? There is no such thing as progress. So what would be a progressive nationalism or not progressive nationalism? Um, then it becomes a matter of personal choice personal attitude and personal choice. I personally prefer to live in an individualistic society. But I can very well understand people who would prefer to live in a collectivistic society. So um, there is no, I don't believe in moral minimalism. I don't believe I am, in this respect, a Durkheimian indeed. The core fact of social reality for me is cultural relativism, meaning that each society has its own values. I can choose as an individual in which society to live, but I cannot tell any society what its values should be. So, um, I personally despise ethnic nationalism. Right? It is my right. But there are lots of things in it that help many people live this life. And I understand that. So, I mean, actually, as, as a sociologist, I try not to make myself, I always, cultural relativism has nothing to do with moral relativism. So that the fact that I understand that societies have different values doesn't preclude me to make my moral choices, right? but I certainly try not to base or force other people to make similar choices. So there is nothing in facts, in empirical reality, that would justify one choice rather than another. It is very unfortunate. It is very unfortunate because we all would like to be um, relieved of the responsibility of making our own choices. And if our choices would truly depend on science, then we would be relieved of the responsibility. But unfortunately, those are our choices. What I am trying to do is to explain reality. That is, you know, this is how it is not to say what should be and what is better than something else. My name is Mikhail Maslovsky. I'm from Sociological Institute of Russian Academy of Sciences and High School of Economics. Thank you very much for your lecture. 
uh, you mentioned that uh, the interest in civilizational thinking revived somewhere around 10 years ago, and it was connected, 20 years ago, and it was mm -hmm. connected with the rise of China. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you know, in historical sociology, there is a, a great uh, tradition of civilizational analysis connected with the name of the late Shmuel Eisenstadt and his uh, followers uh, claim that actually it can be seen as a kind of a, an emerging uh, a sociological paradigm. And uh, so I wonder how you, would you uh, evaluate uh, this approach and its uh, utility for the uh, understanding of contemporary developments, including the rise of China? Uh, well, I, Eisenstadt was one of my teachers, so uh, this is, uh, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, I probably created the wrong impression. I didn't say that, uh, that the interest in civilizations uh, happened, in the renewed interest in civilizations happened with two, you know, in 208. Um, with uh, the Beijing Olympics. I said that China emerged to the world site during, during those ceremonies. You know, if before we could have, we could still disregard it. After that, there was no disregard of China. Um, it was my interest in the concept of civilization. Uh, my feeling that the concept is necessary uh, that um, uh, was provoked by uh, my studies of the East. Uh, so, uh, and uh, before that, of course, uh, the concept, or rather, the word was used. That is, that is the problem. That the word was used. Uh, the, um, it was used. It is a French word uh, that um, um, first emerged as uh, uh, Francis or French intellectuals complement to themselves as French intellectuals uh, in the sense of how very advanced they are. Then it was appropriated and used against them by the German intellectuals in the beginning of the 20th century when they opposed the French civilization to the German culture, you know, and civilization was mechanical and technical while culture was wonderful and not technical. So, uh, and then uh, it was more or less used as uh, uh, in anthropology uh, in early anthropology as a kind of a synonym of culture oh, when both were undefined and a very, very good contribution to the, um, to the concept, to the definition of the concept was made in the 1930, I think, by uh, Durkheim student uh, Marcel Moss, uh, <coughs> his student and his nephew, so um, who was an, uh, an anthropologist, um, really, and uh, he tried he tried really to account for the self sufficiency of civilizations, and um, this was, I suppose, his uh, way of exploring the concept of cultural diffusion <coughs> and where are the borders for the concept of uh, cultural diffusion. This was in 1930. At the same time, uh, his teacher, Durkheim, used uh, the word civilization in a very, uh, I would say, uh, uh, not very useful way as simply the development of humanity, you know, the entire humanity, not something that separates one part of humanity from another, but just the development of humanity. Uh, so it was only a quantitative concept, that is, you could be more or less civilized, but not belonging to different civilizations. Uh, then there was indeed the, um, the um, 
Eisenstadt defined the civiliz modernity as civilization, as a separate cultural framework. That, and I think that this was wrong uh, because, um, because it was purely descriptive and didn't uh, at all point to what made it a civilization. Uh, basically, his concept of civilization was um, a kind of uh, um, without naming nationalism. He basically tried to postulate that nationalism did something to our culture. So, um, and that was the problem, that civilization was used as a word. It was never defined. Uh, and suddenly I realized that the frameworks that we have do not, do not address an extremely important difference behind the differences between historical periods as between modernity and pre-modernity and behind different cultures as between English culture and French culture. So that you needed another, yet another um, level. And so, so this was my uh, reasoning. And this is my concept of civilization. More questions? I, I, I have some then, if nobody, does anybody else want to? Uh, you know, I agree with you, I think, though I'm not sure, but that, that you know, dignity is a modern concept. Uh, and there's, of course, a concept of honor. And nationalists, as well as dignitaries, the privileged elite in aristocratic society, of course, live by a code of honor. And uh, nationalists also live not just by dignity, but by a code of honor of sorts, as you know. So I remember that watching a documentary on 19, in Eastern Europe, where in 1939, confronted with the German threat, the Polish prime minister stands up and says, a nation can lose everything, but it cannot lose its honor. More works to defeat, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would like you to explain how you see the relationship between honor and dignity. Um, I mean, social honor, of course, and, and, and dignity. That's one thing. The second thing is that, you know, the modern world is also defined by certain universalism, not just by nationalism. That universalism originated in the United States, in, in, in England, in France, and spread throughout the world uh, through the declarations of rights and you know, various other documents and ideas. And, uh, it created also, together with nationalism, competing with nationalism, maybe challenging nationalism, some, some kind of cosmopolitanism as an idea. And when we think of globalization, you know, why your title is provocative, we think of globalization as fostering this sense of universalism and, and cosmopolitanism. And I, I just wanted to hear your, your thoughts on how these universalist aspects of modernity you know, fit into your framework or do not fit, and do they challenge it or do they complement it in some way? Uh, so those are my two my two moments. I, I have more, but I'll tell you later. Uh, and those are very thought provoking. <coughs> so thank you, dignity and honor. Uh, I must say that I should have thought about that, but I didn't. So I will try to to think on my feet right now. And uh, the difference, I think, is between dignity and honor is that dignity is very personal. It is experienced, so it is experienced on a personal level. Honor is not necessarily uh, experienced. Honor is not an experience. So dignity is an experience. Honor is something that, and that's why you, you used code, you know, code of honor. Honor indeed 
is very much related to a code, you see? It's the appropriate behavior. So I imagine that uh, a Japanese samurai committing harakiri, uh, he may be experiencing dignity at this moment, though probably he's experiencing something much worse, but uh, he just must do that, right? And so he's behaving, he's behaving in, uh, a, a, you know, in accordance with the code of honor. And he would be, he would be dishonored if he didn't behave in this way. So um, he would lose his dignity if he didn't behave in this way. But when he behaves in this way, you, you see, the experience is not necessarily the experience of dignity. So I think this is, this is the main difference. Uh, dignity is, yeah, I think this is it. It's a personal experience much more than, than anything else. And it is this experience that was given to people irrespective of any code of honor. You see, you only must be a member of the nation <coughs> to have this experience. Um, but this is really just, you know, on the spur of the moment. Universalism, cosmopolitanism, and nationalism. Universalism is um, the uh, feature of Christianity and Islam. Those were universal religion. Judaism created the idea of the universe, but it didn't proselytize. So, but uh, already Christianity, I mean, that was the universal church. So this is very much a part of our uh, civilization, you know, and our civilizational thinking. We think of the world as a universe. So uh, all the values that apply should apply to the universe, you know? Uh, and if, uh, if they don't, then it is a contradiction. So, um, and we always want, whoever we are, we always want to spread our values, you know, as the universal values. Uh, in, um, interesting that in Germany in particular, um, the, um, the uh, arrival of nationalism, or oh, the arrival of the news about nationalism in England and France uh, took the form of cosmopolitanism first, you see, uh, and only later nationalism. First, they would rather be French, yes. you know? Uh, so, um, very, in fact, many of the most important German na early nationalists, they began their careers as cosmopolitans. Um, so cosmopolitanism is already a form of nationalism. That is, it is a form that national consciousness takes. Uh, because national consciousness is independent of particularism. We are all nationalists, even when we don't have a nation to which to apply our consciousness. Uh, the idea of the United States in particular is uh, um, basically the idea of a world society. Uh, the United States tran um, translates the rights of Englishmen very clearly, rights of Englishmen, into the rights of men, of human race. So, uh, and uh, um, the, the ethnic heterogeneity of, uh, of the United States um, it is a model for the nation that could be coextensive with the world. So, um, 
there is no contradiction at all between um, nationalism and cosmopolitanism. Uh, when you consider the entire world a sovereign community of equal members, of fundamentally equal <coughs> members, then this is nationalism, this is national consciousness. Universalism has deeper roots in religion, uh, but yeah, sure, it, it is not contradictory to that too. I have still one more question. Sorry. Uh, I have to take advantage now that, that we spend so much energy in, in, in bringing you here and, and effort. Um, and that, that concerns the idea of individualism. And of course, it's a, it's a commonplace almost, of course, in classical sociology, whether in Durkheim, suicide, or in you know, Weber's Protestant ethic. Uh, and it has been argued, <clears throat> even in some recent books, that individualism is really a product of Christianity and the idea of conscience, and particularly, of course, the idea of, of Protestant uh, Christianity. And uh, when we think of the First Nations, uh, uh, the First Nation, England, of course, it was defined you know, largely by its, by its Protestant orientation. And when we think of societies that are individualistic, I mean, intuitively, even commonsensically, we say, well, of course, it's Australia, it's you know the United States, it's England, it's mostly those Anglo-Saxon societies already, you know, French uh, are individualistic, but in a different kind of way we think of it. Or the goal once said, how can you rule a country that has three, you know, ten thousand different kinds of cheese? <coughs> uh, uh, every cheese is different, and every you know Frenchman is even more different. Um, so. You know, what is the relationship? Because you said that you know Durkheim got it wrong. You know, individualism is not the product of professionalism in some sense, or the, the creating a separate social role, which where you're defined by what you do as opposed to what's your social origin. It is defined by by nationalism, which you know encourages this idea of individual dignity. But again, I return to the idea of, of religion, and I just want to probe to see what you think about that relationship. The concept of individual, you are absolutely right, uh, um, is much, much uh, older than, um, than modern individual. But there was a huge hiatus between the indivi first individual and then the creation of modern individual, so thousands of years. Uh, the concept of the individual as such was created in the Hebrew Bible. It was created by Judaism uh, in the very idea of the covenant, the covenant of God Almighty, the creator of the universe, with every single member of, of, the, of the group, right? Uh, I mean, uh, this establishes the, the idea of the individual as an agent, as a responsible agent. That is, if you don't behave in a certain way, I, God, won't behave in a certain way towards you, right? So it establishes the idea of justice, and all those ideas of freedom, all this we take uh, from, from the Bible. However, when uh, this was swallowed, in uh, um, original Christianity, certainly in the Christianity of uh, Rome, uh, when, when Rome adopted Christianity as its state religion, and was revived only with Protestantism. So yes, that is certain. Priesthood of all believers, which returned to, uh, to, to the Bible, to the Old Testament, and which uh, characterized uh, uh, Protestantism, which characterized England as the new Israel, both in England and then in the United States, the new American Israel. So it, it is the revival of this idea. Uh, but uh, so, but now we are living on, uh, you know, informed by this idea, by this idea of the. 16th and 17th century, uh, even though it 
it was created much, much earlier. Um, so, um, did I answer so how the does, question? How does nationalism then relate to that? Uh, to Protestantism. Yes. <clears throat> oh, well, uh, this is an absolutely beautiful historical um, contingency. Uh, because um, English nationalism, um, the idea that the people is a nation, that we are all equal, emerges um, before, uh, before Protestantism. We already see that in the very end of the 15th century, very early 16th century. And then Henry VIII, who is a perfect Catholic and a, a great opponent of Luther. He writes a discourse against him and burns people who translate the Bible into English, burns them at the stake. He needs a divorce uh, to produce a male heir. And the Pope doesn't give him a divorce. And then he embraces Protestantism for that reason. He doesn't want to do that, but he must produce a male heir. So what happens is that the causes of Protestantism and uh, nationalism, they really converge. And Protestantism serves as a midwife to nationalism. Um, and very much, uh, very much uh, um, promotes it, especially through the translation of the Bible, through the translation of the Bible into English, which is mistranslated. It is a fantastic mistranslation of the Bible. They change the original text, and they change the original text in a very nationalistic way. Uh, and very much like Peter the Great, who was writing his uh, ukazes, you know, in a new Russian, and when he would introduce a certain new concept, he would explain in parentheses what actually he means. So those English translators do with the Bible. You know, they, <laughs> in parentheses, they explain what, what they actually mean. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, but of course, those things became very much related. Anything else, or have there been enough paradoxes for tonight? So tomorrow, the paradox of love, finally you believe. <laughs> uh, what would be better than that? And its relation to nationalism. So I think. I think uh, we're all very much looking forward to that, and we thank you very much for today's provocative Thank you thoughts. very much for working so hard to invite me here. <laughs>